All right, guys, welcome back to Deuteronomy. Yes, here we are in lesson 104. We've got Rich, Kevin, Drew, and TJ in the house. And you know, I gotta tell you, we're, as we're walking through this, sometimes you just, you wanna hit a wall. <laughs> Not like out of anger, but like, ah, uh, here we go again. A bunch of lists of different random things that feel legalistic, that feel like law. And you know what? It is. That's the whole point of this is because at this point, it wasn't about like, to me, it's not about the Holy Spirit moving. It's like, these are your guardrails. Israelites, stick and stay within these lanes. That's really what it is. And I think when I say I hit a wall, it's like these things today, it's like boom, 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 boom. It's just lists. It's a list of this is what you're going to do in regards to divorce. This is what you're going to do in regards to your livelihood. This is how you're going to treat the poor. This is how you're going to you get the point. But at the very, very end, I'm just going to tell you where I'm going. We're after the heart condition. So we're going to go through all the legalism. We're going to go through all the law that they need to live by because they have nothing else. But at the very, very end, how all of that Jesus is going to say, yeah, but there's more than this. So just want to let you know as we're going through this, it's going to feel like you're just trudging through some like mud. <laughs> like I'm getting through this. I'm getting, through, but it's okay because Jesus is going to show everything about this. And so if you would go to, we're going to Deuteronomy. It's just kind of fun. Deuteronomy 23 and 24 now. Quick picture of Deuteronomy 23. We're going to talk about inclusion and exclusion. So like if you have issues with your body, you can't do certain things. You know, like you can't participate in certain things. You can't interact with certain people. And so we're talking about the inclusion. Then we talk about the cleanliness of the camp in Deuteronomy 23. Then we talk about, you know, the fugitive slaves. How do you interact and deal with them? And then, hey, by the way, as you go into the land, make sure you're aware of cult prostitution. And then you want to keep sure, and then he keeps talking about, you know, uh, the interest on loans. And he starts talking about keeping vows. And then you even talk about neighbor's crops. You're just like, whoa, <laughs> this is really a lot. And it's just kind of like, hey, did I miss that one? You know, no, it's okay. And so Deuteronomy 24, it's kind of that same vein of just listing different things. But let's go into the topic of marriage, specifically with divorce. Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. And I just tell you, when I say the word divorce, it's actually weird for me to say. Uh, my wife and I have always just said, we'll never, ever mention that word. You know what I mean? And so, like, for me to teach on this, it's kind of like I'm saying a word. It's just kind of like, ah. So in verse 1, it says, if a man marries a woman, okay, but she becomes displeasing to him. Any thoughts, you guys? Uh, it says he, he finds something improper about her. When you first see that, you have any thoughts about what that means? Initial thoughts? Displeasing to him? Find something improper? It kind of seems like it's on him right now. You're kind of like, ah, I'm done with her. Right? Kind of deal? Yeah, it feels like that. I don't know. But to me, there's a couple ways of looking at this. Again, none of this I can back up. Okay, so I'm just giving you different perspectives, different angles of things to think through. There's maybe some form of this, this displeasing. It could be some form of uncleanness, some form of actual sexual sin. Can't prove it, but if somebody's become displeasing, maybe like, oh, I can't believe you went there. Again, can't prove that. It could also mean uh, that this person goes through a constant state of menstrual irregular irregularity. So like they cannot keep a, a consistent period in their life, which then means that then the husband and wife can't have normal, consistent sexual relations. So different things like this, there are different thoughts. Now, one of the liberal perspectives, one rabbi, one rabbi said, uh, for every cause. C can you go to Matthew 19, verse 3, Kevin? Matthew 19, verse 3. Again, I, I can't prove this, but... Uh, Yes, yeah, so it says, some Pharisees approached him to test him, and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? This any grounds could imply for any reason. Can I, can I just do this for any single reason? Well, one rabbi said, you know what? If you don't like how she made your breakfast, literally this is what he said, like burning my breakfast, I'm done. Like any reason, is there any reason that I can? And so it says, a man marries a woman, she becomes displeasing because he finds something improper about her. He may write her, because of him being displeased with her, right? He may write her a divorce certificate, hand it to her, and then send her away from her house. Like this whole topic of divorce, I'm just gonna cut to the chase. In scripture, there are only two reasons in the New Testament that you can divorce, okay? It has nothing to do with burning breakfast. It has nothing to do with all of a sudden, like you're just annoyed with her, or has nothing to do with even an irregular uh, uh, period for a woman. Scripture says there's two reasons only for a divorce, okay? Can you go to Romans 7, verse 1, 2, and 3? 
Uh, since I'm speaking to those who understand law, brothers, are you unaware that the law is authority over someone as long as he lives? Verse 2. For example, a married woman is legally bound to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law regarding the husband. So in all reality, go to verse 3. So then if she gives herself to another man while her husband is living, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. So really when I say the only, is divorce legal, the only way you can be done with your husband is if he dies. Does that make sense? So they actually give one of the reasons. It's not even a reason to divorce. They're just saying once your husband has passed, if death has to, occurred, you can move on. Again, that sounds really obvious, but that's till death do we part. Okay, the other component, this is the one that, that really everybody knows, uh, is adultery. Okay, is adultery. Uh, Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. Deuteronomy 22, 22 just says, Yeah, if a man is discovered having sexual relations with another man's wife, both the man who had sex with the woman and the woman must die, you must purge the evil from Israel. Okay, well, again, there's drastic, you're going to kill him, but the only reason for any of this, of separation, is because of adultery. Okay, so I just want to get this across the point here. Rich, Kevin, what do you got? It kind of goes back to man dies. <laughs> you just hit one and two in that, in that mm -hmm. verse there. Totally. Don't be afraid to say this out loud. It helps me a ton, actually. I do have a question, though. Like uh, Solomon <clears throat> talks about in Proverbs 21, better to live on the corner of a rooftop than with a quarrelsome wife. Like, does that mean, hey, you still got to be married to her, but you're going to be perched up on the roof? Yeah, it just means you're perched up on the roof and you got to deal with it and you better work on your relationship with your wife. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a long haul. You know, it's the classic saying, go ahead, everybody don't laugh. You know, a better wife means you have a better life in your house. If your wife is happy, so is everybody else. That's the reality on everything. And so I I'm just telling you, honestly, uh, Adult, uh, divorce is not an option unless scripturally it even says unless your wife cheats on you or the man cheats on his wife. And then I'm even going to propose something, even if it happens. You know, some of the coolest stories are when the spouses forgive each other and they work through it. So I'm not even just saying use that as your certificate and say, ha ha, you cheated on me, I'm out. Like I would even just say, hey, look, work through it. Work through that issues. And so again, this is where we're, what we're talking about. In verse 2 of Deuteronomy 24, if after leaving his house, she goes and becomes another man's wife, this is interesting. And the second man hates her. Well, first of all, there seems to be a problem. <laughs> and then he writes her divorce certificate, hands it to her, and sends her away from the house, from his house, or if he dies, there we go. Then the first husband who sent her away may not marry her again after she has been defiled because that would be detestable to the Lord. You must not bring guilt on the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Interesting, this, there's, there's a couple, couple things here. The best way I can describe this, and I know this is family friendly, but there's a whole lot of wife swapping going on, right? That's really what's happening. Yeah, I don't like my husband for a while. I'm going to go to this husband, and then oh, I'm going to come back to him. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. God didn't design that. Remember, he designed us to be a part of one flesh, when you become sexually intimate with one another and then you leave, part of you is still with that person. And then you go to another person, part of you is still with that person. And now you're bringing that person into this equation. Like you're defiling the whole marriage bed. You're defiling the whole thing. That's just not how God designed it. So now that's one, one whole little list of things, right? But now let's go to verse five, okay, if we can of Deuteronomy 24. Now, here we go. Remember the, the army discussion? about people that can and can't go to fight and all this stuff. So you have all these situations. Now, here it is again. When a man takes a bride, he must not go out with the army or be liable for any duty. He is free to stay at home for one year so that he can bring joy to the wife he has married. In other words, I want you to focus on getting your marriage right because I don't want you to be like verses one through four. I want you to work on verse five so that this is not an issue that you're handing out certificates of divorce. That's, I think that's a cool tie-in, honestly, because maybe the distraction is if he goes off to the army, then maybe, maybe that woman loses focus as well. All right, let's keep going to verse 6. Verse 6 then begins to transfer over to a different topic, and it's totally a different topic. Do not take a pair of millstones or an upper millstone as a security for a debt. You're like, I thought we were just talking about marriage, because that is like taking a life as security. Scripture continues on, right? This is crazy to me, you guys. 
If a man is discovered kidnapping one of his Israelite brothers, whether he treats him as a slave or sells him, the kidnapper must die. You must purge the evil from you. Wow. Okay, where are we, where are we going here? Well, in verse 6, if you can, go back to verse 6, okay? You can't take a millstone away from people. Why? Because this is their livelihood. Okay, so in an interaction and talking about debt, if you take away the essentials for provision, he goes, that's going against what I'm implying. You are not to do that. Okay? I mean, that's really the bottom line. Don't take away things that people depend upon for their provision. I mean, a millstone is the essential tool to, to get and make a proper food. So then if you get into verse 7, okay, now all of a sudden if you found a guy who's discovered kidnapping one of his brothers, whether he treats him like a slave or not, that dude must die. Okay, so now we went from provision, don't take away provision, but now if you kidnap somebody, you will die. <laughs> and oh, by the way, remember I told you at least eight times, you must purge the evil from you. We don't want anything like the rebellious son. We don't want anything like the kidnapper to, to permeate the country of Israel. So let's just remove that kidnapper now. Let's just kill him. I mean, I don't know how else to put it, but that's where we're at today. Okay, moving on in verse eight. And I'm sure there's more angles to this. I get that, but remember, I wanna to get to the heart condition. These are the lists that we're going through, okay? We're going through the divorce concept. We're going through the livelihood, don't take millstones away. We're going through, if you kidnap, you will die. Okay, you get all this. Verse eight, be careful in a case of infectious skin disease. Following carefully everything the Levitical priests instruct you to do. Be careful to do as I have commanded them. Remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam on the journey after you left Egypt. Okay, now here we are in two verses. Now we're talking about questioning leadership, right? Because that's what happened with Miriam. Miriam questioned her own brother Moses. And so she actually, uh, she made a false report about what Moses was doing. She made a false report about his leadership. And she said, hey, this is not right. We need to be leading as well. And so then as a result, scripture just says, guess what? You could get leprosy just like she did. So now all of a sudden you're talking about, hey, don't, don't question the leadership if God's given that person in that role. <laughs> but we're just talking about millstones. We're just talking about kidnapping. We're just talking about divorce. And sometimes you just wonder, Moses, did you have, did you have schizophrenia at this point? <laughs> hey, oh, I forgot about millstone. Oh yeah. Hey, let's not forget about leprosy. Like, ah. anyway, it's all right, guardrails. My point is, oh my, I can't remember all these things, right? Well, in verse 10, here we go. Let's talk about pledges. When you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, do not enter his house to collect what he offers as security. I love this one. That'd be like me going in Richardson, knocking on my neighbors, hey, you know, at three in the morning. I noticed I left you a, a, a loaf of bread. I'd, I'd like it back now. You know, the neighbor would be like, why do you have to ask now? Like, you're not supposed to enter in the house to collect it. That's not our role. So in verse 11, it says, here's what you're supposed to do. Stand outside while the man you are making the loan to brings the security out to you. Okay, ask for it and then wait outside. Don't impose and walk through the house and say, hey, I wonder, I wonder where my loaf of bread is. Like, that's not our role. And I think sometimes he's just explaining common sense. And I love this, one of the, yeah, Drew, this is for you. This, this makes me sound um, smart for a second. One English poet said this. <laughs> I don't ever read English poems, but I feel like you might. <laughs> a, a man's home is his castle. Like this is his one place you don't touch. You don't walk in and act like, oh yeah, you own this. Now, strange enough, in, in, uh, there's one house actually, you guys, uh, that there's a gentleman who's actually making his house into a castle. Do you guys, have you seen this? Just outside of, uh, you know, northern Indiana, he turned a normal house into a castle. And I'm like, yep, it's totally legit. He totally thinks his house is a castle. Uh, you must now call me from now on, Sir Kyle Lancelot. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome though? But I think the point is this, okay? This is what I'm getting at. Like your house is your domain. Whether you put a castle on the front or not, like you don't just walk in and act like they, they owe you something. Wait outside, walk through the proper procedure about what this looks like. In verse 13, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, in verse 12, if he is a poor man, you must not sleep in the garment he has given as a security. Okay, verse 13, be sure to return it to him at sunset. Then he will sleep in it and bless you. And this will be counted as a righteousness to you before the Lord your God. 
Like, don't take away their clothes if this is all they have. Don't take away the clothes if this is what they sleep in. It's not for you just to take it away. Now in verse 14, do not oppress a hired hand who is poor and needy. Whether one of your brothers or one of the foreigners residing within a town in your land, you are to pay him wages each day before the sun sets because he's poor and depends upon them. Don't, don't wait three weeks. Don't wait four weeks. Pay him every day. Otherwise, he'll cry out to the Lord against you and you will be held guilty. Kind of makes me think of the land crying out, like guilty. And then in verse 16, fathers are not to be put to death for their children. Now, this is huge, you guys. You understand this. This is actually on our verse, on our wristband. Let me read it and I'll finish. Fathers are not to be put to death for their children or children for their fathers. Each person will be put to death for his own sin. There's an individual responsibility for our own sin. It's actually not dependent upon our fathers, okay? So when we talk about this on our little wristband, okay, we have the New Testament, sin, death, love, faith, life. When you flip them inside out, it's the same thing. And so we have sin and we have death. And our death on our black on the Old Testament is Deuteronomy 24:16. This is where we say, look, you're not going to die because of your father. You're not going to die because of your grandfather. You're going to die because of your own sin. We must bear our own individual responsibility. Now, now, crazy enough, even with this verse, it still makes my head spin because the scripture says, but we can also be guilty because of our families, right? Have you, do you guys remember these verses? Let's go there if we can. Uh, let's go first of all to... Uh, God can bring, well, let's go to families can be guilty. Go to Joshua 7, verse 24. So on the inside of our wristband, here we have, you know, our death verse, Deuteronomy 24, 16. But now watch, families can be guilty and death can be upon ours. So in Joshua 7, verse 24, we're going to build this up to three verses. Then Joshua and Israel with him took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the cloak, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his ox, donkey, sheep, his tent, and all that he had and brought them up to the valley of Achor. Okay, real quick, just want to make sure you notice, Joshua, let's go back, says Achan, a son of, and then who else is with him? His sons and his daughters, right? Verse 25, Joshua said, why have you troubled us? Today the Lord will trouble you. So all Israel stoned him to death. They burned their bodies and threw stones on them, verse 26, and raised uh, over him a large pile of rocks that remains to this day. Now go back to verse 25. Guess who else died? They burned whose bodies? Their bodies. So not just Achan. So because of a father's sin, and, and uh, which leads to death, then the kids as well. So this is where I wrestle with Deuteronomy 24, 16. So I just, I'm walking you through this because I'm sounding this else as well. Scripture says we're responsible for our own sins. But in the Old Testament, that's key. In the Old Testament, there were some families that were found guilty because of somebody that their father or grandfather did. I can't, I can't tell you I'd like to pair this up and say that totally makes sense. But I at least want you to be aware of what other verses are saying. And in fact, Scripture says God can bring death to a whole family. Exodus 20, verse 5. In Exodus 20, verse 5, it says this, You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for their father's sins to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Now you're just kind of like, oh, what do I do here? Because now we're saying that the sin can pass down third and fourth generations because of uh, maybe what a family member has done. And I'll, I'll just tell you, Jesus can cut all of these spiritual ties. Jesus can cut off all of the generational sin. He can totally do that. And in fact, I think you actually have to acknowledge it. In fact, I had a family member, my, my grandfather, who had uh, an affair. And so I actually went to the church where he had an affair. Now, you're not always going to be able to do this. I get that. And I understand that. That's okay. But I went and I got outside of that church building and I prayed and I asked for forgiveness. And I asked that none of that stuff would carry on into my dad. None of that stuff would carry on to me. None of that stuff would carry over to my son, Jude. Like, I don't want any of that stuff. And so I get this, that like we are responsible for our own sin, but I also want to cover everything in my family. So Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, Fathers are not to be put to death for their children or children for their fathers. Each person will be put to death for his own sin. I don't know, you guys want to jump in on any of that stuff? I think it's easy to carry the generational sin if you don't choose to, to deal with it. I think, I think people do all the time. I don't know. Drew, I'm curious on your perspective on this. I don't know. I mean, I, I, yeah, I agree with Kevin. Like those things are, but I think it's also hard to spot sometimes. Totally. Or, or I guess it's, um, 
you say, I'm not going to do that, but it sneaks up on you, and you kind of end up doing the same thing maybe in a different way. It's hard. I, I totally agree. In a weird way, I'm going to go the obvious route. It's like a kid who never had a father figure. He never saw how a dad was supposed to treat the kids or as a husband treat his wife. There's a really good chance that that kid is going to reflect everything that he just saw or didn't see in a good way. And so there's obvious ways and then there's other ways that aren't as obvious. But I will just say this. Every single person is still responsible for your own actions. We are still responsible and there will always be consequences for whatever we do. We are responsible for those. We can't say, oh, well, that came on us. We can ask for forgiveness and we can't break that because we are responsible for our own actions. So sin, right, leads to death. That is on us. But praise the Lord, his love comes in and takes care of the death and the sin. So again, here we have Moses. He's going through all these kinds of different lists. And now in verse 17, he switches gears again. He says, <laughs> Do not j deny justice to a foreign resident or fatherless child. See, there it is. That's the American message right there. Why are we getting rid of illegal immigrants when we're supposed to be taking care of residents or fatherless children? As Christians and as believers, yes, you take care of them. You let the government decide what they need to do. Our job in this role, right? I want to go to a heart condition is we're supposed to love everybody. You let the government decide because we're supposed to submit under them. Does that make sense? You're not supposed to play the role of the government. And then, by the way, do not take a widow's garment as security. In other words, I need to make sure you guys, you're taking care of everybody. Don't just try to shortchange them because they're, they're, they're disadvantaged in this. Or maybe they're poor, maybe they're needy. And in verse 18, it says this, Remember that when you were a slave in Egypt, I love this, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this. In other words, you were a foreigner at one point as well. Therefore, I'm commanding you to do this. And in verse 19, scripture says, when you reap the harvest, uh, and again, you're going to see this common thread of foreigner, fatherless, and widow, okay? Three times, three types of people. When you reap the harvest in your field and you, get, and you forget a sheaf in the field, don't back to go get it. Don't worry about it. It's to be left for the foreign resident, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. In other words, don't be such a cheapskate that you got to get every single little thing. Let them be blessed by the work that God has given you. And in verse 20, when you knock down the fruit from the, your olive tree, you must not go over the branches again. Oh, did I get everything? No, no, no. What remains will be for the foreign resident, the fatherless, and the widow. Scripture continues on in verse 21. You see the same thing. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you must not glean what is left. What remains will be for the foreign resident, the fatherless, and the widow. Do you think that God cares about foreigners? Absolutely. You think that God cares about those that don't have a father? Absolutely. You think about God cares for those that have lost their spouse? Absolutely. And God says, because of the work that I have provided for you, let them receive the fruit. Because at this context, they can't always get what you have. And I just, I want to speak into the, into the whole government stuff. Like, look, you can get argued, you can mad, you can get all you want about all of those situations. I can tell you this though, you can find somebody that doesn't have a father and go love on them. You can actually find a foreign resident in your community, go love on them. You can find a widow, go love on them. We're talking about a heart condition in all of this because in verse 22 of Deuteronomy 24, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this. So what do you do with all of this? It, it seems like I would say randomness, doesn't it? It feels like a checklist of the law. And you're like, hey, make a copy of it so that everybody can remember this so that they don't get cursed, that they get blessed. And we're going to weigh out everything that you're walking out because you're going to walk into a new land that I'm going to give you. And you're like, I don't know if I can even remember half of it, which I just taught. And I believe Jesus is showing us, yeah, guys, but all of these things, this is going to sound really bad. It's almost like they don't matter if you're going to remember or not, because if it's in your heart, you'll always do what God's asking you to do. You'll always do what seems to be the right thing. So you won't be in question. And so I want to go to, Kevin, can you go to Matthew 5, verse 17? And we're just going to unpack six things. We're going to get there here in a second. But in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, here's what, here's what Jesus says. Don't assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Jesus isn't coming to refute all of this. No, no. He says, I didn't come to destroy. Here it is. But I came to fulfill. In verse 18, scripture says this, For I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all things are accomplished. Verse 19. 
Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches people to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In verse 20, so just so you can know, breathe a little bit in 19. Okay, even if you don't get it all right, look what he says, you're still a part of the kingdom of heaven. That makes sense? You're still the least in the kingdom of heaven. But if you are doing these things, you are the great in the kingdom of heaven. And then in verse 20, it's a cool picture. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. All right. Based on that passage, I got to go to Rich on this one. Rich, what does that passage mean right there then? If you'll never enter the kingdom of God, what's the only way you can according to this, this verse? Well, there's no way I'm, my, my righteousness is going to surpass the scribes or the Pharisees. So I really don't have a chance. Okay, so does anybody have a chance? Not that I can see. Good. Kevin, you want anything? No, you have to have the righteousness. Yeah, you got to let the righteousness of Christ come upon you. Awesome. It has to be the mercy of Christ. It has to be the mercy of God, right? Abs absolutely. Okay, so here's where I want to go with this, you guys. You know, think about this. In Matthew 5, 21 through 48, Jesus begins to talk about and compare murder to anger. He begins to compare adultery to lust. He begins to compare, oh, by the way, divorce is going to get stricter. And then talking about how we want to, he wants to prevent lying even further. And then he talks about restraining retaliation even one step further. And then he even goes to the point where he, he commands us in, in verses 43 through 48, you got to not just love your, your, your neighbors, but now you got to extend your love to, the, to your enemies. And you're kind of like, whoa, the only way this can happen is if there's a heart change, if there's actual a heart condition that's not based on legalism, but it goes back to, I love God with everything I have. Matthew 23, verse 27, Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside. Oh yeah, you look great. You might even have the tassels dangling, but inside are full of dead men's bones and every impurity. You guys, you, you can't fake this. You can't fake walking with the legalism. You can't fake this because inside it, you might not be murdering them, but scripture says you're, you're actually committing uh, anger. You have anger issues. You might not be committing adultery, but you might be lusting. And he says, I want you to work on everything on the inside. And the only way that's possible is if you're dependent upon, it's what we went back to, you guys, dependent upon the mercy of Christ, dependent upon who Christ is in your life. In Romans 8, verse 10, kind of, I feel like, puts a summary to all of this. The only way we can continue to have these rails and function in freedom, it says in Romans 8, 10, says, now if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. Now, you ready for this? But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Got to tell you, I love this. The only way that righteousness comes out is if the Holy Spirit is inside of us because we put our trust in Christ and not in ourselves. You can't fake this legalism. You can't fake this law. Eventually, it'll catch up and eventually you start giving into these sins. And I'm telling you, there's freedom, though, when you allow the Holy Spirit to, to move and breathe in your life. And that's where the righteousness begins to take off. All right, that's lesson 104. Here we are plowing through Deuteronomy 23 and yes, 24. It, it's, it's a lot, but the reality is, is you don't have to worry about being a lot when you put your trust in Christ who gives you the Holy Spirit. Thanks.